loud and clear. Um, this conference will now be recorded. Okay, go ahead. Um, if uh, you're dialed in and you're getting some feedback, um, it might be because um, if you're like me and you use a headset, uh, sometimes the sound on your computer can cause that, so you might want to mute uh, your sound. Um, and then for some of those who are asking, uh, are there handouts? Um, we can send a copy of this presentation um, after the webinar. And as a reminder, this webinar will also be recorded and posted on the TASC website. So if you're afraid that there's anything you might have missed, um, you'll be able to, to go back, listen, or, or thumb through some of uh, the slides. That being said, um, I wanted to say uh, greetings to all of our FLEX coordinators and our FLEX personnel who are calling in for today's call. Um, my name's Kevin Chaney, and I serve as the FLEX program coordinator with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. Um, and today I'm also joined by uh, my amazing FLEX staff members, um, Yvonne Chow, who's our MBQIP coordinator, Sarah Young, uh, kind of our policy guru, and Christy Edwards, who will be talking with you more a little bit later about some of the um, really, really cool EMS work that she's going to be working on here at the Federal Office for Health Policy. Um, for those of you who are uh, able to look at the presentation, um, in the spirit of winter, and it was just a year ago that I made my first uh, site visit to a critical access hospital in Cook County, Minnesota, um, and I can actually gladly brag that this year, a year later, we have more snow where I'm at than there are that than there was in Minnesota when I was visiting there uh, last January. Um, next slide is uh, some photos that I took as well as um, my colleague Sarah Young, just kind of give you a, for those not uh, in the area, a flavor of the snowfall that we got. That's my dog, uh, Layla, who um, Unfortunately, due to her age, is not enjoying the snow as much as she typically does. But uh, we certainly got a lot. I know 30 inches here in the Baltimore area. So today, um, again, this webinar is, which is again being recorded, is meant to serve as a high-level overview of Flex, um, as well as kind of what's the history of it. Um, where is Flex housed within the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy? Who are the project officers? What's the structure look like now? Um, as well as who are TA partners, technical assistance, um, and evaluation partners? What are some of the challenges that we see from a high-level programmatic uh, part of Flex? What are some of uh, the Flex data and synthesis work that we're doing? And then what are some of the communication pathways and, and opportunities that uh, we're trying to make sure that are clear and consistent um, just given the level of information that's associated with Flex. And then at the end, I will open it up to questions. So if you come up with a question, I would ask that you save it just because kind of got a lot of slides to try to get through today. So where do we begin? Well, it's almost been 20 years uh, since the Flex program was authorized um, by the Social Security Act in 1997. And just as a reminder for those who might be new to the FLEX program, uh, the program was established in response to the rapid increase of, rough, of rural hospital closures that we were seeing um, in the 80s and during the 90s. And what this program did is it established critical access hospitals to be designated as an official criteria. Um, and then the FLEX program was also established to help those uh, hospitals convert to that status if they, made, if they met certain eligibility criteria. And we saw a rapid increase during this time period of critical access hospitals who then were able to um, have cost-based reimbursement uh, status as opposed to PPS. The FLEX program also worked to um, create the grant program which engaged state designated entities um, to help in the conduction of activities around planning and implementing rural health care plans, networks, again, designating facilities, small rural hospitals as critical access hospitals, uh, and then also providing support for these cause around areas of quality improvement, reporting, performance improvement, and benchmarking, 
as well as integrating rural emergency medical services. Um, the language that you see here at the bottom is more of an update that was amended to the authorizing language in Congress um, in the about 2009 or 2010. And that's what leads us to today. Uh, today, FLEX is composed of five program areas, um, quality improvement being the big one. Um, and many of you will uh, hopefully have heard the term Medicare Beneficiary Quality Improvement Program, or MBQIP. Uh, that's kind of the, the main pillar for which all of our quality improvement work is associated. Uh, but we also do work on financial and operational improvement, population health management, and emergency medical service integration, COD designation, and then a, a new program that was added was the integration of innovative models. So some of you might be saying, okay, we're fairly familiar with the FLEX program, you know, as it is the five program areas and be uh, But I think it's important to also have an understanding, well, where's FLEX house? You know, what does it look like? Who's responsible for this? Um, and what this slide is meant to kind of show is uh, FLEX is housed within the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. And, you know, I think obviously that would, a lot of people, okay, well, that makes sense. Um, well, where's Federal Office Rural Health Policy housed, or are they kind of a standalone? And we're housed within the Health Resources and Services Administration, which is under the HHS umbrella. And then within the Federal Office of um, Rural Health Policy, we have four main divisions, and one being the hospital state division, which is where the FLEX program is housed, but as well as we have the community-based division, the policy research division, and the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth, or as we call them, OAT. Uh, the community-based division is where you see a lot of our network and planning grants, development grants. The policy research division uh, does work with our research gateways, and then the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth obviously does a lot of grant work around telemedicine and telehealth. But for today's presentation, I want to focus mainly on, obviously, FLEX. Uh, but I also want to provide some context that while FLEX resides in the hospital state division, the hospital state division, and some of you may be familiar with, also runs two other important grant programs, the State Office of Rural Health Grant Program and our Small Hospital Improvement Program, or known as SHIP. And this next slide is meant to kind of show you a little bit more detail about these three programs. Again, well, today that we'll be spending our time talking about FLEX, but it, it's meant to just kind of give you an idea of the number of states that we work with, what is the dollar amount typically associated with these programs, um, and then also what are our other grants and resources um, that we utilize to assist us with these programs. Um, you'll see some acronyms over here, and I will get to those. Um, uh, a little bit later, but what this is meant to also kind of convey is we certainly do from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy within just the hospital state division. We offer a lot of uh, excellent grants, resources uh, to help facilitate and promote programs as well does our other federal uh, partners and divisions within the federal office including CBD, OAT, and PRD. That being said, um, it's still not enough to cover necessarily all the need that is out there in rural, um, but it certainly is meant to help serve as a safety net and to help you know, the work that we do in our office inform not just HRSA, the Health Resources and Services Administration, but HHS. This next slide, uh, entitled The Big Picture of FLEX, um, is really meant to show kind of what I consider our main pillars around the FLEX program and how it's uh, structured and the support that you as grantees receive as FLEX coordinators within your state. Uh, our partners certainly, uh, you know, can't forget our Technical Assistance and Services Center, TASP, uh, our newest partner, ARPEDA, uh, which is the Rural Quality Improvement Technical Assistance Grant. And then our FLEX monitoring team, FMT, um, which is a consortium of different members who help us with our evaluation work. 
uh, in general, Flex serves about 45 states. And it's approximately ranging anywhere right now. I've seen 1,332 critical access hospitals to about 1,334 critical access hospitals. Um, and it seems like that number fluctuates um, on a weekly to monthly basis, just depending on the increase in closures that we've been seeing, but also some states have seen some expansion of critical access hospitals. The program in itself, the entirety, is around $22 million. Um, I know for some that might seem like a lot, but when you start to boil that money down across states and then to a certain call level, you can see that those dollars can really start to minim become smaller and smaller. On the FLEX program, we have four project officers uh, that have grantees that we oversee. And us as both grantees and working with our FLEX partners, and even you as FLEX coordinators, uh, we work with data. Uh, we, work, we have work plan data that we get from U.S. Flex grantees. There's financial data out there on critical access hospitals and how they're performing that um, our partners, such as FMT, uh, works with. We have quality data now uh, in which both TASC and Arquita help us to look at, in addition to the pillage and or what we are now calling our quality data reports that come in on a quarterly basis based on the certain measures that uh, states and critical, ha critical access hospitals are reporting on. And then we have our PIMS data, which is our uh, performance improvement measurement data that you as a grantee report to us on an annual basis. We try to use all of these types and uh, boluses of, of data to help make improvements and lead us as a program. Uh, one of the important things, and I, I know the map is a little small on the slide, but you can get an updated map from the FMT website, is all those little dots are meant to represent where the critical access hospitals are in the United States. And uh, for me, when I look at it, I think it just shows there's a lot of them out there. Um, they, they clearly, this is not a small program by any means. And the level and impact that we can have is actually quite large. So without further ado, um, I mentioned uh, some of you have been around the program for a while. We know you may uh, remember back in December we made some changes to who was serving as project officers. Um, and so this slide is meant to convey not just a name, uh, but also to give you the contact information and a face. So that way now you have a face with a name as it relates to the um, as us, as, as your project officers. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the program coordinator, and um, you'll see me there uh, down in the right-hand corner, uh, hopefully looking spiffy. Uh, that is from my wedding that I had this past summer. And then next slide. Here is a uh, map, and this is actually the HHS region's map is uh, how it's been color-coded. Uh, but you'll see how we've been broken up. Uh, we're still clumped together as project officers. The only difference is that me, as a program coordinator, um, has kind of been sprinkled across from the West Coast all the way to the East Coast. But otherwise, we are still kind of in an aggregate um, as far as the regions that we are serving. But I think more importantly, and as this next slide will uh, demonstrate, is what is our role as a project officer and beyond just maybe in the past as that liaison role to a certain region. Um, all of us as a project officer, all four of us, um, are here to help assist you as a grantee in your grant monitoring functions. And this is all typically done via as you may be hopefully familiar with, EHB or electronic handbooks, which is the system that we use to help process many of the East grant related items. One of those being is that's where you'll find your notice of award. One of the things that we do as a project officer is follow up with you once that notice of award goes out. What are some of the terms or conditions that's in the award? Is the amount correct? Um, becoming familiar with your grant application. One of the other things that we do is we serve to process prior approvals in case something might be happening and you need a, uh, a change in scope. Or if you have a carryover request that's come in due to an unobligated balance. We also will work through your non-competing continuations that will be coming up, as well as reviewing quarterly reports if that happens to be a condition on your grant. 
but as PEOs, we also work with our partners, TASC, Arkita, and FMT, uh, for sharing grantee progress, status checks. Um, we also let them know if we think that there might be some TA needs based on the communication that we have with you, as well as our fellow uh, project officers. And we also are going to be working on FLEX um, as not just your PEO, but also in an opportunity for us to specialize more deeply in and across the program areas for when that way when we act with a grantees. And it doesn't just mean that you being my grantee because I'm your project officer. It also means that I will be able to work with and other POs will be able to work with other grantees based on hopefully some of the more in-depth knowledge that we're going to be able to have as it relates to the FLEX program regardless, again, of what region we're serving or what our state assignment is. And I think that's something important. You know, we are certainly there as your PO, but we'll also be there um, kind of as these content experts. And what I mean by that, and you'll see here on this slide, is with NDQIP, obviously, um, if you haven't uh, met her yet, um, I know that she's looking forward to meeting you. Hopefully you've seen some emails from her, but Yvonne Chow will be serving as our NBQIP coordinator, and she's going to be really embedded with the work that our NBQIP uh, quality partners are doing, such as TASC and Arkita, um, but also getting a better understanding of what our states are doing as it relates to quality improvement work. Um, as it comes to, you know, kind of our financial and operational improvement, area and the work that's being done there. And since that can often be impacted by policy work, it makes sense that Sarah Young is kind of our go-to person there. Uh, population health, that's an area that I have a strong interest in and uh, based on my prior work, um, just seemed like would be a good fit, especially as this is a new area that we're uh, moving into as it relates to uh, the innovative work that we've assigned or have been able to have with this new FLEX program this year. And we've had some great um, ideas and some activities that have come in from some of our, our grantees that we're really excited about, and they tie in well to that population health framework. And then last, but certainly not least, uh, you know, we as a program, you know, we've been hearing, we've heard uh, you and uh, our, our grantees about the need and uh, the role that EMS has in rural. And that's why we're really excited to have Christy Edwards on board as a team member who will be doing a lot more uh, work as it's related to emergency medical services. And all of them will be talking a little bit later about some of the work and communication channels that they're doing. And then again, lastly, I, I, I think this might come up, you know, is well, all of these other POs seem to be in a certain group or territory, and I've been spread across. And again, part of that was done a strategically and so that way I could enhance my own awareness and program connection based on what's happening because we know that you know all states are different regions are different and there is uh, some uniqueness to what's happening in states and this allows me to kind of be embedded in those different areas so obviously us as POs um, we certainly couldn't do everything by ourselves and we rely heavily on our technical assistance and evaluation partners to help us make improvements but also kind of serve as our right and left hand at times to be able to help provide uh, support and services to you as our grantees and so again that's the flex monitoring team FMT task our technical assistance services center and then our KEDA rural quality improvement technical assistance center um, who others might know as Stratus Health, who's had a long partnership with us. More specifically, um, for those who may be new or unsure, so what does our technical assistant partners do? Uh, TASC uh, develops webinars. They work on workshops for us, resource guides. Uh, they help provide subject matter expertise. Uh, to support our FLEX grantees and co improvement efforts across our five FLEX grant program areas that I mentioned earlier. And they've been with us since 1999, so they have a long history and relationship with our program. Arkita uh, also has a long history with our program, but they're a more recent official edition um, serving as our Rural Quality Improvement TA. Uh, we realized that as we were expanding the work in the quality improvement section and the need and the focus area here that uh, 
we certainly just needed more help. And we're really excited and happy to have Arkita working with us and TASC and FMT. And they're here to help also assist you as grantees and cause with challenges around data reporting and improvement. Uh, hopefully some of you have seen the NBB Equip monthly newsletter that just went out. They've been working on toolkits. They'll be providing one-on-one -on -one consultations um, as the years progress. Um, and they're also going to be working on other resources that we hope that you will find simple and useful um, as you also work on areas related to quality improvement and reporting with your critical access hospitals. One of the other, you know, kind of important prongs that I mentioned is uh, flex evaluation and research. We need to know from a programmatic standpoint, you know, what are things looking like? How are we making an impact? And the flex monitoring team is certainly the ones who help us in that area. And the flex monitoring team, it's, it's a unique consortium uh, based of Rural Health Research Centers at the University of Minnesota, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and Southern Maine. And each of those kind of work on certain specific areas with the quality, EMS, finance, uh, cost closures, et cetera. Uh, but they all come and work together to help us as the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy to evaluate uh, the impact of both the FLEX program, but also our other programs. And they serve as a key resource for synthesizing work plan data, quality and financial data. Um, and then they use this data and synthesis to help create policy briefs and other reports um, as informed by these data elements. Um, and they've been really important working with us to also understand what are ways that we can uh, improve our ways that we measure uh, programmatic uh, data to help us uh, make better program improvements. Now, I've already mentioned, you know, the project officer role. I've talked about our TA partners and our evaluation partner. Um, you know, we certainly, again, rely on more than just those partners, too. Uh, we also rely on our uh, National Organization of State Offices of Rural Health, NOSTOR, National Rural Health Association, NRHA, um, and then as well as the Rural Health Information uh, Hub. And all of these are incredibly important partners and stakeholders that help serve as kind of the voice and the communicator uh, to help us also remember as a federal office what are the needs of rural and what may be some changes that we might need to think about from a, uh, from a program standpoint. And that goes beyond just, just flex. Following um, slide uh, is a flex mind map, and this was something I did when I first started, as I was trying to understand what are all the moving pieces and components to flex. Uh, we often joke in the office that flex is a beast. Um, I think that maybe uh, this diagram, and it's not really meant for you to be able to tell like what each of those bubbles are, but really what it's meant to demonstrate is it's a complex program. Um, hence why we're having today's orientation and why we have been working uh, really hard with our partners and our TA partners to think, are there ways that we can streamline our communication efforts? What are some of the challenges that we're seeing? And what are the things that we can do to maybe help overcome those barriers and challenges and make life for you as a grantee a little bit more simpler and less cumbersome and complicated? So all that being said, you know, seems simple enough, right? We're We've got all these partners in place. We're working hard. But again, there's certainly challenges out there. And I use the Rubik's Cube because if you look at it, it's like, where do I begin? Where do I start? And I think one of the things that our job from a federal office and our partners is to help you go about understanding what does your Rubik's Cube look like? They're all uh, different, but there are certainly things in there and patterns and ways that you can go about to help maybe solve or put together in place, um, you know, getting a little bit closer to, to completing that puzzle. And one of the things, though, in order to do that is you have to understand, well, what, what are the challenges? And it's important to understand what the challenges are from us, from a federal office standpoint, is there are certainly national and federal-wide uh, challenges. 
Um, there's also state level challenges, and then there's local challenges, and then there's challenges also at the call level. And what the slide is meant to convey is flex is hard because it doesn't have necessarily a direct connection to the beneficiary. Uh, we work with state designated entities who create programs that are then meant designed to help the critical access hospitals in their state who are then providing services to patients. And as you can see, as you go along that line, um, we don't provide direct care, but we can be utilized to provide TA to critical access hospitals uh, to help them with assessments and um, enhance resources. These are very under typically resourced communities and they're short staffed and they have a lot of challenges. And it's important for us to understand that from a federal office at the state office level so that we can help develop TA uh, resources that best meet their needs. Um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, the program, it's about 22 to 25 million dollars certainly seems like a lot of money, but after a while, you know, once you start handing it out to certain states, and some states have a lot of critical access hospitals with, you know, we all know that they have a lot of various levels of need, and um, the dilution of that funding can happen kind of quickly, and so we need to be able to maximize our resources and target high needs, and what are those high needs, and what are the most pressing needs? Um, are there ways that we can rethink networks, group purchasing? I think that's a big area that we'll be, um, we've looked at and we will continue to look at. Um, but it's also what are the short-term needs and versus long-term planning, measuring impact. Again, uh, you'll, you've heard a lot about us from an office talking about the importance of measurement. We heard a lot talking about cause and the things that they need to measure you know, when it comes to quality improvement reporting. And we're certainly all in this together as far as uh, trying to, to measure and find out what makes sense to measure. And that's something I'll talk about in just a bit. Ultimately, what it all boils down to is the ability for us to collect not just any type of data, but good data. Data that helps us tell the story of rural uh, from a local level, state, and national perspective so that way we keep our programs informed, we're able to see if what levels of improvement we're making. They can help us inform policy decisions, but it also helps us understand where do we still have high levels of need, where maybe we need to target more resources or come up with a different strategy. So a little bit looking deeper into how do we use data to inform performance. You might have seen this past summer um, we had a OMB slash paper redaction act notice go out related to the collection of work plan data um, that you are submitting and then how we plan to use that um, for our performance improvement measures uh, tool, or as you may also know of it as PEMS. Um, and the purpose of PEMS is really to collect data um, on an aggregate level on selected work plan data. Um, and it's meant for us to kind of see are we, how are we doing when it comes to improvements and our, what level of trends are we seeing when it comes to tracking those improvements. And it's also meant for us to kind of capture real-time work plan data post the non-competing continuation submission, which will be right around the corner. And we know that a lot of work's going to take place between then and when the uh, next non-competing continuation um, is due. And uh, very shortly, we hope to be able to share that tool. Um, I think that you will all be happy to know that it has been greatly uh, refined. A lot of the questions from the prior PEMS um, have been both streamlined um, and, and organized to try to just make it as systematic as possible. And it's more of a high-level data collection, so it's not as granular maybe as it once was. Um, and we, again, look forward to being able to share that with you soon. Uh, but we also use other data. We use the MVQIP data reports that you also get, we get as well. Um, FMT helps us with those uh, reports and evaluating uh, what kind of just in general trends that we're, we're making. Uh, but it's important for you as a state to go look at those reports and see, are there benchmarks that you could set? Is there areas for improvement? Um, are there gaps that you're seeing where maybe improvements not happening as much as you anticipated? Then we also have access 
the cost financial data, which FMT again helps us with. Um, and one of the things we can do there is we can identify critical access hospitals who might be working on a particular activity and see, did they make improvement? Was their progress made? Are states employing innovative ways to target and improve financial or operational improvements? When you combine all of these data elements and sources, it helps us from a federal office. What we do is, um, I like to think of it as almost data triangulation and synthesis, and we utilize our partners um, and sync to kind of look at this data and understand where are we going as, as a program and where might we um, still have areas that we need to address or things that we could do better. Um, just like with the things that we ask you to do, it's always one of these certainly work in progress, but we're always looking to improve. Um, this is just kind of meant to represent the synthesis of this flex data that I just mentioned. Um, and in the center is a picture I took uh, with program improvement there in the, in the center, because that's what we're always striving towards, is uh, a reminder that it's, it's a path. It's a long path. It can be winding. Um, and uh, there'll be times where things are going smooth, and then other times where it might not be. But just a reminder that um, you know, if you have questions in, in your own office about, well, I'm not sure how to measure improvement, uh, reach out to your PO, reach out to task. Um, if it's quality related, you can always reach out to task, and we're there to try to provide you with um, resources for, for how to how to, how to help along those areas. Uh, but then also providing you with. Um, data and uh, data reports that are understandable, readable, and how do you help utilize those reports uh, to make improvements with your program? So again, the synthesis of this flex data and why it matters, and I'm spending a lot of time on this because it is important. Um, one, it allows us the federal office and to task to identify baselines. We can track trends and improvements. We can also maybe pinpoint in on best practices based on levels of improvement that we're seeing. And again, this is fed back into the FLEX program. And then we look to share it broadly with states, regions, rural partners, and providers. It also informs the work that TASK and Arquita does around their tool and TA resource development. Um, and it has, allows us for strategies for not just MB Equip, but other parts of Flex. And again, and part of this, I think you're going to hopefully see us going, is from a lot of the initial work of MB Equip was on reporting, reporting. And now we're trying to really move into that hard part, the improvement part. Um, and you need data to know where and how are you improving. Uh, but it also can provide more context for FMT's evaluations that they do with uh, FLEX and their in-depth analysis as it relates to some other policy briefs, which again are very, very important, um, not just at the federal, federal level, but they're meant to inform your state programs about what might be happening in other states. Um, and again, just as I mentioned, it ultimately it helps inform HHS leaders and Congress on the impact FLEX is having and what opportunities still exist for um, improvement. So this data component really is important, and it's what we are able to stand back and present. Um, and we need to be able to stand on it and say, this is good, strong data. Now, we just talked about data as it kind of relates to the FLEX program, the things that you're doing in those activities. Well, then there's also data related to the FLEX program and how we manage the FLEX program. This is something internally that we use as the federal office. And it's important for you to keep in mind as a, as a FLEX grantee is, you know, are you spending funding effectively? And this comes over, you know, are you having a high UOB comes in? Um, are you updating your PO on challenges and seeking out guidance and assistance, you know, from us? Or, um, you know, it, it's okay if something, you have something at work planned and it might not be going just as you anticipated. Um, let us know. And it's, early, it's best to let us know earlier rather than later so we can try to um, help you think and strategize ways uh, to overcome some of those those barriers, but it's also important that um, you're timely and thorough on your response to reporting requirements. And these all get at, as you can see in the middle here, is program integrity. Um, and that's something also that you know we are striving for within the federal office, obviously. Not just making you know, improvements out there with, with current 
local access hospitals and rural health, but also us as a grant program as well. So, again, I've just given you a lot of information, um, which is why this is being, again, recorded and we'll be sending out these slides. Um, but a, a big thing to keep in mind is, well, how do we, given all this information, pull it together and make sure that, you know, the left hand is talking with the right hand. And uh, one of the important things that we do here at the office is, uh, and as this slide is meant to communicate, is at the center of it all are you, our, our flex coordinators, our critical access hospitals who treat the patients, the members, the, the rural members of our society. And, you know, certainly I'm not going to say that there aren't silos in government. We know that it sometimes is a nature of the beast, but we work really hard within the federal office, and I think we've also been looking to incorporate other elements and uh, things to try to make sure that we break those silos and that we are talking and, and making sure that we're informing each other as best as possible so that way, again, the ultimate goal is serving you and providing great customer service and ensuring that you have the resources and the tools necessary uh, to help you do your job. Um, so at HSD, one of the things that we do is uh, we have our PO team huddles, and we try to understand what's going on, what are we seeing, and, and we do this about every other week. Um, you know, I work with my states on a one-to-one -one basis, but then I touch base with my other POs. What are we seeing? What's going on? And it helps inform me from a program coordinator level. And I also touch base with our other divisions within the federal office. Um, we have meetings with our TA providers. Our TA providers have meetings and making sure that they're keeping well coordinated. Um, and I, I'm going to throw a shout out to our KEDA and TASC for the work that they've done around the quality improvement and reporting work um, and the TA and resources there. I think they've done, um, and I hope you you will find them an excellent job and will continue uh, to see the fruits of, of their labor that we've been working with them on. And then also F FMT, um, they're a very important partner and play an important role um, in us understanding the data that we are getting. And then they have a lot of really useful reports that can be used for trending um, and, and state data. And I'll talk a little bit more. Uh, coming up about where you would find those things so that way you can incorporate them into your flex program. Uh, but again, part of it is pulling it together and by utilizing all of these elements and keeping you at the center, um, I think it helps us get everything to the corner. There's that Rubik's cube that showed up and it's looking a little bit more uh, complete, but this is a complex program, uh, you know, and, and part of it is understanding, well, where do I go? Who's the information? Where is it coming from? And so that's what this next component of this webinar is, is meant to do, is showing you to help you understand uh, and essentially keeping informed on FLEX. And uh, I've got some important target areas here of sources of FLEX information and communication that I think are kind of the key important components and pillars. One of those being the FLEX and NB Quick Coordinator updates that get sent from our federal office, and they're sent to the FLEX coordinator's ORHP at ruralcenter.org email address. Um, and what these are meant to do is complement things that you see in the monthly rural route updates, which is something that TASC sends out. Um, but they also provide programmatic reminders. They provide important dates and events. Um, we provide our MB Equip updates via, via this route. Um, and then coming up, understanding that sometimes people lose emails, can't, it, you know, it's hard to keep track. There's a lot of information. It's, Task is going to be creating a landing page that will have kind of these flex updates. Um, and they'll be updated as time goes along, but they'll also include some regulatory updates. Um, as well, so for those of you that are interested, but it'll be a standing page, so you know that you can go there and you'll be able to find um, those that type of information. Um, as I mentioned before, rural route 
that's a, uh, a monthly publication sent out. There's a lot of really great information in there. Um, and you can find, uh, you know, if you missed it, there is an archive on uh, the task website. And I would encourage you to, to go there and to, to read through it. It certainly highlights the work that we're doing in the field and various CA programs, CA recognition, flex coordinator rec recognition, uh, but also letting you know about the coming events and TA events and webinars. Another way to keep informed is, as I mentioned before, as part of this kind of program of integrity is uh, check in with your PO. As POs, we should be checking in with you, especially around certain important programmatic requirements and reporting things that come up, whether that be your um, FFRs, unobligated balances, carryover requests, which is currently the time period that we're in, coming up into the non-competing continuation uh, in the spring. And then if you have a quarterly report that's due, something that we should be reviewing and checking up with you on. Um, and you know, and never hesitate to reach out to your PO. And then other sources I think that are really important for Flex information is again the task website and the events page, um, which highlights all the different webinars and resources that we find tasks to help us put together and provide to you as a Flex program, as well as uh, Arkita. Uh, rather than having another maybe website, Arkita is working with TAS to put all of their IndieQuip related resources on the TAS website. Um, one of the important things uh, I wanted to highlight too that's coming down the pike is we're working really hard with uh, TAS and Arkita to refine some of the previous elements uh, that we consider very important for a FLEX program. Uh, one being the FLEX coordinator's manual, uh, which we're looking to refine because we're coming out with um, another uh, more all-encompassing thing called the Flex Core Competencies, which will be coming out in March. Um, but again, we're, those are some areas that I would highly suggest as a Flex program that you go look um, to read and reread things because they do get updated and we are looking to make some fairly significant refinement changes. Also, we're looking to bring back the virtual knowledge groups um, around the FLEX program areas. Uh, hopefully, you've seen an email I sent out before about the one for quality that's coming up uh, towards the end of February. TASC also has a excellent population health portal. Talk a lot about data um, and things that you can be doing as a program to help inform what's happening in, in your state and where do you maybe begin if you're looking to put together activities for your program. Highly recommend going to the Task Population Health Portal. And then I would also highly recommend, if you're not familiar yet, going to the Flex Monitoring Team's um, website. Uh, the Flex Monitoring Team will also be coming out with a uh, complimentary portal um, that will help you do more kind of peer-to-peer -peer comparison groups, not just within your state at the critical access CA level, uh, but across regions based on various quality financial um, data. And that is looking, I believe, to launch in February. But also on the FMT uh, website, you'll find policy briefs, data reports for your state, and that establishes kind of benchmarks related to different quality reports, as well as financial data related to critical access hospitals. And it also will give you um, things that we get to as a kind of a more national level look. So the FLEX, I call my you know, kind of must-have resources. Uh, certainly the grant guidance. You're working on FLEX, it's important to know what's in the grant guidance. What are the things that you should be working on? Uh, the coordinator manual, which I mentioned, will be getting a bit of a facelift this spring. Uh, the MB Quick Quality Guide. Um, the Core Competencies Guide will coming out in March. Um, and then again, FLEX data reports and portals, task, FMT, the Compass portal that will be coming, um, all very, very um, important aspects of the FLEX program, as well as keeping up to date about related TA events. So I'm going to the next slide, and uh, this is going to be about NBQIP communication and the different things. Obviously, NBQIP is a huge part of the FLEX program. Um, Yvonne Chow, our NBQIP coordinator, 
Um, Yvonne, I believe it starts to, to unmute your line. We'll kind of walk us through these boxes. No problem. Can everyone hear me? Great. Um, so hi, I'm Yvonne Chow, and I'm the new MB Equip coordinator. Um, as, as we all know, that MB Equip, um, the quality improvement side of it, is a major focus of the Flex program. And uh, we know that critical access hospitals and Flex coordinators face a lot of uh, technical hurdles and barriers, and so we are working to provide um, multi-support around this area, um, which requires a lot of well-coordinated approaches to um, keep the flex coordinators informed about what is currently available and what is coming down um, the pipeline. And as Kevin already stated, uh, we continuously work with all of our external partners. Um, these are TASC, Arkita, FMT. Uh, we also work with our federal partners. As you can see from this slide, um, this gives you a big overview of the resources we provide. Um, but there's a lot more coming down the line. And I'm really excited about them. I'm hoping that they can be used to improve um, the quality of care in your hospitals. Um, Kevin already um, mentioned a lot of them. Um, um, you get communication from FRG. These are the MBQIP updates when it comes to the reporting reminders, changes in the ADTC um, specifications manuals. Um, there is also the MBQIP data report delivery, um, which we send through the NH secure transfer um, by your PO. Um, and we definitely uh, try to send them out as soon as we get them, uh, just so that you can use these reports to um, improve the internal processes within your hospital. Um, from from TASC, Arkita, and FMT, as Kevin stated, um, they continuously work together. You're always communicating, and um, I'm also communicating with them on a very regular basis. Um, from then, you will see the MQIP monthly. The first one already came out um, in January 2016. Um, they can be found on a TASC website. Um, there are TA webinars as well as um, resources such as the manuals, the fact sheets, the reminders, as well as the FMT reports. Um, there is the MBQIP virtual knowledge groups that we're revamping. Um, these are facilitated by Arkita and TASC that are working hand in hand um, to provide you with um, an open forum to discussing challenges, uh, brainstorm ideas and strategies in terms of assisting hospitals towards reporting and participating and improving um, in the four quality domains. Um, we also continuously work with our federal partners, um, such as CMS, to plan webinars on related and equipped measures. Um, the latest one we had was on OP27 um, measure. Uh, about the NHSN and how to sign up. Um, from the tracking sheet I got, 41 states um, participated in this webinar. And so definitely we were very encouraged that um, a lot of critical access hospitals and um, partners participated in it. And because I hope that um, it's addressing one of the needs, especially if this, um, since this is a new measure for many. Um, all of this is to say that they require a well-coordinated approach. And um, we at the federal office are continuing our efforts to create clear communication channels um, regarding all of this information. Um, we're continuously working um, on how to communicate to you, um, how to develop and distribute the MBQIP related resources with our partners, TASC, Arcadia, and FMT. Um, we're creating pathways um, to gather feedback from you as the flex coordinators and as the critical access hospitals um, through different mechanisms. We launched the advisory council headed by Arcadia, and that really is a consortium of a lot of the um, big players and just um, the a way for us to get feedback on the 
resources that Arquita specifically provides to you, such as the reporting reminders and the monthlies. Uh, we're also using the virtual knowledge groups um, as another vehicle to gain feedback from you. Um, we're really excited about the first one that's happening on February 18th. Um, another way we are um, continuing to gather feedback from you is through the TA request tracking. We really encourage you to use the task um, at ruralcenter.org um, email because that is how we track every TA request that comes in. And then we as partners can look at the trends and see where there may be gaps in terms of the technical assistance we're providing you and how we can improve on it. And so we really encourage your feedback through that as well as through your POs. Um, and so that's, uh, I bring it on to, uh, next is uh, Sarah. Oh, we're going to jump back to me real quick. Okay. Um, and, Thank you. and so, yep. And so, just to kind of build upon what Avon was just talking about is again the importance of that shared communication and opportunities, and that peer-to-peer -peer approach. Really, um, is something that we're really wanting to emphasize and target in on. A couple big opportunities for that as part of the Flex program. One being obviously the Flex reverse site visit um, that we have in the summer. Um, it's a requirement in a flex grant to attend, but you know I, I think it's highly valuable, um, and, and it's really designed specifically as an opportunity for you as a flex coordinator to not only re receive TA from good speakers and, and everything, but it's also an opportunity to, sh to share, network, and connect, not just with your project officer, but with your fellow flex coordinators. I mean, I think that's sometimes one of the most exciting things is being able to hear what other states are doing and having those more personable conversations. Um, but around the FLEX program, you know, making sure that, that we're doing more than just, you know, that one time a year is reestablishing um, the uh, virtual knowledge groups. We mentioned we had one for quality, and we're looking to have one in the realm of uh, the other flex program areas, so financial operations, population health management, innovative models, and then another one that focuses just specifically on kind of running the flex program because it's a lot to run. Um, and one of the things that we're going to be working on is that these are facilitated, recorded, um, and so then that way we know that these are a lot of calls. Um, we understand that not everyone might be able to attend everyone, but they'll be recorded and you'll be able to touch base, or maybe you just attend the ones that are the most need or most interest at that point in time, and uh, you switch and go from certain ones, and, and that's certainly okay. Uh, but there are certainly other opportunities, and we as an office try to make sure that we have people there in attendance. Uh, NRHA has several things one being the Policy Institute that's coming up. I hope to see some folks there. Um, but there's other, you know, co conferences, and we try to make sure that we have someone in uh, attendance for those if our budget allows or if we've been allowed to, uh, been asked to come and speak, as well as regional state co conferences and then site visits. Um, you know, it, it never hurts, you know, if you feel like you'd like your PO to come out and visit, or if we think we'd like to go visit you, we'll certainly um, connect. But, but don't be afraid to ask. Uh, and again, as Avon mentioned, we have a lot of advisory committees and, and work groups um, that we are trying to be a part of and keeping in the loop so we can maintain those levels of uh, communication. Uh, one of those being, I know, the JC Rec, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Christy Edwards to kind of let folks know uh, more specifically. Um, I know there's been a lot of questions about it, but what we're doing as an office as it relates to EMS. Christy? Hi everyone, I'm Christy Edwards. Uh, so right now there are 28 states currently doing EMS activities and working on needs assessments. Uh, and there are another six states who are doing EMS needs assessments. So my role here is to look at EMS in the FLEX program 
and find out how FLEX can better support evidence-based EMS activities, facilitate sharing among the states, uh, and improve uh, assistance to FLEX coordinators. In order to do that, I am uh, currently engaged in one-on-one -on -one conversations with all of the FLEX coordinators in states working on EMS in the FLEX program. Uh, I'm planning to conduct the remainder of those calls in the next month. So if your state is working on EMS activities and you have not yet heard from me, you will soon. Uh, so going back to the JC Rec call. Uh, so JC Rec uh, has a monthly conference call, the Joint Committee on Rural EMS Care. Uh, they have a monthly call on EMS issues. Um, they have a lot of uh, there have several different kinds of several different groups involved in that. Uh, the National Association of State EMS Officials, um, as well as the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, uh, as well as uh, partners in the Flex program. Uh, so if you're interested in participating in that, please let me know, and I will get you connected. Um, so the other thing is that I have also already been hearing a lot about uh, the desire for more opportunities for flex coordinators to share resources, uh, talk about successes, and discuss challenges. Uh, so watch this space for more opportunities to connect with other state flex program on EMS issues. Uh, I'm also engaged with uh, federal partners and also with TASC and FMT uh, to figure out how we can better support all of you in working on EMS issues in your local areas. Uh, I'm also here to serve as a resource for uh, flex coordinators on EMS issues, so please shoot me an email if you have questions, challenges, or ideas and feedback. Um, I am always happy to hear uh, about what's going on uh, in the flex program and what we can do to better support EMS in rural communities. Thanks, Christy. And then last, but certainly not least, uh, Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about the policy side of things? Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. Um, as Kevin alluded to at the beginning, because Critical Access Hospital is a special Medicare designation, that really implies that Medicare policies have potentially a lot of impact on cause and the work they do and the work you all are doing as flex coordinators and flex programs to support these critical access hospitals. So one of our other roles in the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy is being that voice and resource for rural health care when it comes to understanding what's going on in the federal policy realm that can impact your programs. So working towards that, we try to provide regular um, critical access hospital related policy updates to the FLEX stakeholders in the FLEX program. That includes monthly policy updates in the Rural Routes newsletter. Um, and we're working to have those posted on the task website, along with the rest of the World Route material. Uh, we include a quarterly review of proposed and final rules and any other significant um, Medicare policy changes in the Task 90 webinars. And really, for the purpose of this discussion, you know, what our flex policy is really focused on the federal rules and federal regulations and guidance coming out of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the FX cause. Um, 
you can use the word policy in a lot of other contexts. I'm sure nearly everyone on this webinar is likely already receiving the announcement from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy that we are sending out weekly from the office, and that includes information about of direct interest to flex programs, but also a wide variety of other rural relevant resources, upcoming funding opportunities, upcoming comment periods and requests for information, um, and a whole range of other other stuff. You can email Michelle Daniels, who's on the screen on this slide, if you would like to sign up for that newsletter and you're not getting it right now. And um, as well as pushing out information to you all, we're trying to, to use the FLEX program as a way to directly answer policy-related questions you might have and get input from you on what kinds of things you're seeing in your states and working with your hospitals that are impacted by. Medicare policies and other federal rules and regulations. Um, so when you have questions about federal policy, um, definitely feel free to contact your project officer or contact me directly. My email's on this slide. And um, we can often answer some of those questions you have and those questions you're getting from, from your cause. But at the same time, if you're seeing significant issues, new problems, um, tell us. Bring that information to us because that is very useful for our work and informative as we develop the FLEX program over time. One of the significant things that we've been engaged in for the past two years or so and many of the FLEX coordinators have been really helpful partners on this, is tracking rural hospital closures in partnership with the North Carolina Rural Health Research Program. Um, we, when this started to be a concern uh, that more rural hospitals were closing in 2013, we learned pretty quickly that there wasn't any single source of up-to-date information about what rural hospitals were closing or where. Most available information was had a big time lag. So we started this tracking project based on reports from the media and reports from you all. And if you have seen the North Carolina Research Program's tracking page now, it's a very comprehensive list of rural hospital closures. That's an ongoing project. Please keep reporting changes or other information related to closing the rural hospitals um, to me and to the and I can share that with the UNC team. And it's always nice to hear about hospitals opening too, although unfortunately that doesn't to happen as much. So in summary, you know, send policy questions to us. We want to be a resource for you when you get those kinds of questions from your critical access hospitals and other stakeholders as well. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so just to kind of close, and I right on the dot here, um, but we'll, we'll, I can certainly stay open to ask or, uh, excuse me, answer um, any questions you might have, uh, although I'm sure you're probably still digesting all the information. Um, again, we'll be sending out um, the slides. This is recorded, so, um, you know, if you were either, you know, distracted or got tired of listening to me, uh, you can certainly go back and re-listen uh, to this. And, Again, I just want to reemphasize it's a lot of information. Uh, the FLEX program, being able to, to run a FLEX program, and it just requires a lot. There's a lot of moving parts, and, um, you know, so it's okay to take one step at a time and always be on the lookout for new updates. 
notes and resources that we send out. Um, I'm going to look over here on the chat screen, see if there's any questions. Ah, uh, yes, more acronyms. Absolutely. It's what would the government be without them? Um, but I will make sure, though, in the slides that if there is an acronym there, um, we've, had, we've got it spelled out because even I have a hard time keeping track of, of all of them. And I see some folks are typing. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to um, ask a question on the line. I believe it's star two. To, okay, to I'm unmute, just going to that... remind people it's star two to unmute your line if you'd like to ask a question. Hi. Yeah, um, this is Kenny in South Dakota, and I have kind of a question slash maybe suggestion. Um, I, I get a lot of questions from my partners and um, in the state, and I try to, you know, try to interpret those questions, you know, and, and ask, you know, you guys either regarding the MBQIP or policy or whatever. Um, and I, I guess I would like to have, so there would be a, a you know, like a page either on task or it would be like a link where if, if they have a policy question or a, or an MBQIP question or, you know, just probably just so you can filter it a little easier. Like, I know you gave us an email regarding policy. And, um, that's probably the area, too, where I would have 